All right, my name is Claire Allen, and I'm a master's student in public policy and global affairs here at UBC. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Jacker here today. Um, just first, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are being on traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And this day's talk is co sponsored by the UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, as well as the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. So we're honored today to have Professor Mark Jackard here. He's a leading Canadian expert on energy and climate policy. Professor Jackard has been with Simon Fraser University since 1986 in the School of Resource and Environmental Management. Professor Jackard's built a successful research career on the design and application of energy economy models to assess the effectiveness and cost of sustainable energy policies. He's also served as the chair of the BC Utilities Commission and has advised energy and environment, environment policymakers around the world. Professor Jackard has also worked for the International, climate, uh, International Panel on Climate Change and was a convening lead author for sustainable energy policy with the Global Energy Assessment. With that said, I'll turn it over to him and please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and thanks um, for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, this was all booked up, but I'm, I'm still trying to teach some economics to my UBC colleagues. Should have charged people five or ten dollars. That's all you need and then they'll show up. You know, skin in the game. Um, <laughs> So, and anyway, it's been nice to be out here. I've, uh, my good friend George Holberg, I've been to his graduate seminar this morning, but it sure rains a lot out here. Um, we don't get much rain up at Simon Fraser University. It's just, uh, I guess, above the clouds or something. It, uh, anyway, quite a shock. Um, so, uh, I'm going to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes. That'll give us another 35 or so for questions, and I really do encourage lots of questions and discussions. Everything's fair game, uh, and so let me let me get right to it though. And uh, I'm, I do have some jargon in here. I will try to explain it uh, or write down if uh, if you didn't if I didn't explain it, and you can come back um, to go after that. So. I'm going to use a shorthand here for economically efficient. Greenhouse gas reduction would require an economy-wide carbon tax, and I call that a C-tax, with the revenues used to reduce um, un what we call unproductive taxes, and possibly to re reduce any regressive effects, like harming low-income people. Although that, in economic efficiency, we don't have to care about low-income people. That's a social choice. We're just, when we talk economic efficiency, it is simply achieving an objective at the lowest possible cost. And so and a carbon tax is seen as the ideal way of doing that. And in the period 2007 to 2009, I helped design BC's economically efficient uh, carbon tax. <clears throat> and, but this experience generated for me a hypothesis that pursuit of economic efficiency globally, so what are we doing as a planet and that's a re in reducing greenhouse gases, the amount of greenhouse gas reduction that makes sense economically, that achieving that may require some trade-offs at a local level, like British Columbia or Canada, or even in the city of Vancouver, between our economic efficiency objective and political acceptability. And so my talk is going to be a lot about that. Uh, it's going to dominate it. And and, I wanna, and I'm going to have a couple of slides sort of in the middle of the talk that remind us of what I mean when I say our global path is economically inefficient. I'll be using the Stern report of, uh, of a decade ago. So the challenge then is to shift more rapidly uh, to a more efficient path globally. And I'm going to argue even though we may have to make some trade-off and it won't be perfectly economically efficient greenhouse gas path. Um, so. I just want to say, though, that just, even though I'm focusing on economic efficiency in this talk, it doesn't mean that I believe this to be the only important uh, criterion in climate policy. I start most talks now with a slide that says effective greenhouse policy is easy in the classroom and extremely difficult in the real world. And we were just talking about this this morning. There are there is so much research how people who are concerned about this issue, and you wouldn't be here if you weren't, 
think that a lot of people think like we do, or, or with just a bit more information would think like we do. And really the evidence doesn't show that. It just shows that human beings are a very diverse set and uh, a small percentage are concerned about this issue uh, in, a, in a focused way, and then a larger percentage are concerned about it because they hear uh, that concern, especially if they hear it coming from sources they trust. But otherwise, uh, they are not focused in, at all the way we are. This Windows feature update is here. Uh, someone help me with that? Pick a time. So just click pick time. Pick a time. All right. Thanks for your idea. I'm going to leave this to you guys. So, so, um, so when I, so what is, what's on that slide? Oh yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, okay. This is unlikely. Right. So globally, economic, so I just told you about a C-tax. Globally, we should have a C-tax. Try to imagine that happening in the world. Well, there was, there was a lot of debate about that 20 years ago. I was involved in it. We were analyzing how are we going to get all the countries to have a carbon tax or, or one emissions price through a global cap and trade system. We don't talk about that much anymore. And, and, and the obvious reason is that global governance institutions are weak. We haven't been able to reach agreements like that. And so we're going to have a case where we have leading jurisdictions. We're going to have jurisdictions that are first movers. And there are going to be costs to that. And there, the trade exposed industries in those jurisdictions, which really are all industry, are going to make compelling arguments in a political sense to resist a high carbon tax. And, and, and thus rep, um, blunting the kind of rapid transformation we need to do. So, just think of that, like what we heard, we've heard in debates in British Columbia and elsewhere, we've got to make industry do this and do that. My argument is don't make industry do anything. Now, that's going to upset some people, come back at me in question period, but I think you're going to see why I'm saying that near the end. Um, and then effective domestic greenhouse gas policy is also difficult, uh, like, so we, I've just told you why globally, but now think about an individual country. Well. Fossil fuels are incumbent, right? We 85% um, reliant on fossil fuels in that, uh, as of the energy we consume, coal, oil, and natural gas. And also, <clears throat> um, many regions are making money from developing, extracting coal, oil, and natural gas. And Canada, and even British Columbia, or our neighbors, Alberta, are certainly a big case on that. The other is that energy efficiency and renewables are not as cheap as advocates claim. And my talk is not about that today, but it's something that I've written a lot on. And if people want to follow up with me, I can, I can guide you to the literature on that. And I would say that most leading researchers who are not biased in some way, like advocates of energy efficiency, definitely agree with that statement. Um, and the benefits of greenhouse gas reduction are, of course, politically distant in time and space. Uh, it's not like uh, a politician coming into power and, and people saying, we need you to fix ICBC, as was the news this morning, or hospital wait times for hip replacement surgery. Uh, this is something where the government won't, there will be nothing tangible at the end of four years that, that will help them to get reelected. It, it, the only tangible thing will be that they maybe impose some regulations or they raise taxes on, on, on uh, gasoline. <laughs> And, and so therefore, what I'm calling faking it policies, so those, and I think you know what I mean, but sometimes faking it policies are policies where the government says, here's our target, pick a really aggressive target. Um, oh, maybe I can, I can uh, Stephen Harper's a great example. He said, yes, by 2100, I'm phasing out fossil fuels. So that's perfect. And, uh, and then he said, um, and, uh, and we're going to use regulations. But it's just going to take a couple of electoral cycles before we can negotiate those uh, regulations. But please re-elect re us. And so he got re-elected twice without... He imposed one regulation on coal plants that would kick in in the year 2035, something like that. Um, so our, our carbon tax in British Columbia, though, is widely recognized and certainly was 10 years ago, but even today as one of the leading policies in the world. 
It's a carbon tax, and so I want to make sure that we all understand what it is. I mean, many of you do. It's on fossil fuels. Uh, it reached $30 by 2012. The new government is, uh, is going to bring it up to 35 in April. It's revenue neutral, which means the government calculated that we're going to get this revenue in as carbon tax. So we are going to proportionally cut income taxes and corporate taxes and make direct payments to people along with the GST rebate they get from the federal government. Um, and that's all of the money is going to go back that way. Now, you can't actually track all the money. So that's going to be something that I bring up. But that was the, that was the forecast. That's how we estimated. Um, and the, my group at Simon Fraser University, the government used our model to figure out how much revenue it would get with the carbon tax. Then they used the Ministry of Finance's model to see what the income tax and corporate tax cuts uh, that would be appropriate with that revenue. <laughs> So, and what's been the effect? Well, this has been, for me, it's a bit humorous because economists, colleagues from Harvard, from uh, MIT, Stanford, all make pilgrimages to British Columbia to study our carbon tax. And it's quite, um, it's a bit of a strange conversation because they'll say to me, well, you know, it's fantastic you were involved in this. And, and then I start telling them all the things that are wrong and why, uh, which I'm about to explain to you. And, they, and then they're kind of like, okay, we don't want to listen to that. We're, um, we'll just move on. What we want to notice is that it was economically efficient because it's the same carbon tax level on all combusted fossil fuels. It's predictable. We set up a rising schedule over a five-year period. Some of you will remember that. Reducing those taxes on income uh, for corporations and individuals are, have an effect that economists call the, the productivity uh, gaining, which means again, more economic activity, and that, that can score in our economic efficiency uh, sense. And even it did focus on equity. So there were uh, different issues about what the effect was over a two-year, four-year, six-year period, but at least in the first four to five years, uh, research of a former PhD student of mine, Nick Rivers, you know, shows that lower-income people were better off. Most lower-income people, and, and unless it was this a weird combination where they were rich enough to be driving a car and they were commuting an enormous distance and it was a really inefficient car and so on and so forth. So we can't model for every instance. There's variability out there, but mostly uh, it was, it was uh, not regressive as a, as a combined policy measure. And there was no administrative cost. Like, just imagine, there were no extra jobs created because of the carbon tax in government. So basically, the, everyone was paying, like co corporations were paying gasoline taxes, we were paying them, uh, natural gas tax, they just changed the number. That's all that had to happen. So uh, a, a, a fantastic policy in that sense. And I, and I do wholeheartedly support it and believe it would be wonderful if all humanity used this policy to get its emissions down. Now, what's the political and policy context for that tax, though? So it was implemented during a period of climate concern. People will say, well, we're in a climate concerned period right now, awareness. But they, they, for, they forget. Like People like me can't forget, because it's been my career. Um, that was a period in the mid-2000s when there was lots of stuff going on. And the Nicholas Stern uh, study I'm talking about, the economics of climate change, I'm going to come back to that in a later slide. So BC Premier Gordon Campbell set these greenhouse gas targets. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you remember, in California was, California was driving ahead. They created something called the Western Climate Initiative, um, which it's at one point, uh, just a few years ago, only had Quebec and California in it. And I was with the Quebec deputy minister, and he said, I've been trying to explain to my minister why we're in the Western Climate Initiative. And they're like, what, what are we? And he said, we're west of Newfoundland or something like that. Anyway, we're west of something. Um, and, but also, Campbell had a shotgun policy approach. Like, everyone says, oh, brilliant. You only need a C-tax. He did a C-tax. Wrong. He didn't do a C-tax. He did a bunch of policies. A low-carbon fuel standard. They started the, I believe, they wrote legislation for a, uh, or a regulation for a vehicle emission standard, energy efficiency regulations, and so on. And, and there's even people in this room who bled a lot doing that. My, my good friend Warren Bell is here. <laughs> Uh, we lost Warren for like, I don't know, a year and a half. He was in some basement in Victoria uh, in, the, in the legislature building writing, writing legislation. Um, the sea tax got the public's attention, uh, but the intent was to phase it out. And Gordon Campbell said that to me. We're going to phase it out as we join California's cap and trade. And that way, we'll be increasing global economic efficiency. Remember my earlier point? Like, we should have policies that are global, not local. <clears throat> 
So what was the political and economic efficiency outcome? Well, we had the 2008 federal election, and Stéphane Dion said, see, carbon tax, I'm going to run on that. Stephen Harper won, campaigning against the job-killing carbon tax. And there's different polls on this and political scientists who do surveys, but what I'm told from the people who do that kind of work is that that had a, a significant role in just um, making the difference in that, in that close election, in that election. <clears throat> um, so we had a decade of federal climate inaction. So that's economically inefficient. So that's the, these are the important points I'm trying to make here. And yes, this is a bit of an economist-focused talk. In BC, the NDP opposition launched an Axe the Tax campaign. It's all ironic right now. But in six months, that caused Campbell to lose a 20-point lead in the polls. And he was saved just before the election by a global economic crisis, which shifted the focus uh, back to the economy while oil prices collapsed. And that's, um, you know, that's not me saying that, it's uh, talking to people who were doing polling at that time. Um, and in fact, Catherine Harrison, who's a prof at UBC, is someone I rely on a lot, and including for this slide. And I forget what her source was for it, but it doesn't matter so much. The top line was polling showing what, you know, what percent, what was your intention of voting if there's an election tomorrow. And the, the time period here is from about, uh, is the beginning of 2007 uh, through to 2009. But really, I'm interested in, um, as I said, almost a 20 point lead in the polls when they announced the carbon tax and when the NDP launched the Axe the Tax campaign. And then by the time you get to November uh, 2008, um, you know, they're, they're, the, the Liberals on are, are on a trajectory to lose that election, and then the economic crisis happens, and everybody forgets about climate, and start thinking about um, who we do we want to vote for in, the, in this future of economic uncertainty. And because of the economic crisis, the price of oil plummeted. So here was like the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and the Vancouver Sun trying to remind people, do you know you have a carbon tax and it's going up and it's all the fault of the government. And at the same time, people go to the pumps and they saw the gas price starting to fall. So that was the reality in which we, we went to that election, which Gordon Campbell uh, barely won. So lessons from defending the carbon tax. Government and us academics could not counter the Axe the Tax framing tsunami of fake news, op-eds, editorials, talk shows. This had nothing to do with the nice university world of evidence-based rational debate and then picking which, or which uh, policy is best. And most people, therefore, assumed they were net losers. And this is interesting because 70%, um, uh, even the carbon tax supporters, said, well, I'm probably a net loser. In other words, the extra money I'm paying out each year in carbon tax is not compensated by my income tax cut. Um, so 70% of even the people who said, I support the carbon tax. So it was kind of like, I'm doing this for the planet. I believe I should pay more. And in British Columbia, we, we do quite well on those kind of polls, actually, which is something to be proud of. But it actually wasn't true. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for this. It's kind of fun to think about. Um, <clears throat> Actually, 80% uh, of people had a net tax decrease of, of individuals and individuals and households. And the reason is, for one thing, the corporate income tax cut w did not um, give back to industry as much money as we collected from them in revenue. And so there was actually a transfer from industry to uh, individual uh, taxpayers and consumers. So there was a transfer from industry, so the, the two tax cuts were designed to make sure uh, that people uh, were getting money from industry. And industry was grumbling about this, but Gordon Campbell was their favorite son, so it was a little easier for a right-of-center politician to do that. Secondly, and this is the fun part, when we were doing our modeling, and I said to the finance guy, Angie Robinson, the assistant deputy minister, I said, okay, here's our estimates of how much money you'll take in each time. And then they calculated uh, what the tax cuts you know, would cost them in income. And he showed me these numbers, and, and I said, well, look, you show that in every case, this is, this is actually a net tax cut, because you're never going to take in as much carbon tax revenue as you're giving up in an income tax cut. And he said to me, absolutely. And the poli political leader, Carol Taylor was the Ministry of Finance, Gordon Campbell, they told us, really, <clears throat> Under, you know, we know there's a lot of uncertainty what's going to happen in year one, year two. So we, we want to make sure that under no circumstance 
does the government accidentally uh, collect $10 more than it gave back? Because the media will be all over us that this was a tax increase. Now, it's too bad that Gordon Campbell didn't, wasn't thinking that way when he did the HST, because uh, that one showed that it was a slight tax increase um, when he got rid of the PST and converted it to the harmonized sales tax. But he did that later. So unfortunately, winning this election, I think, was not good for him in the sense of feeling like um, he could do anything. So, so that's interesting, though, because the experts in the, in the classrooms were all like, oh, yeah, revenue neutral, this works perfectly. Well, in the real world, there's no way you would do a revenue. To have a revenue neutral carbon tax, it couldn't be revenue neutral. It had to be revenue negative. Um, so it survived. Christy Clark, uh, I, sources say she might very well have killed it or dramatically reduced it, but she also needed to balance the budget. So she would have had to increase those income taxes. So that's kind of the fun the fun part, and we thought about that a lot in the design. So something to keep in mind is resiliency. Now, carbon tax advocates seem uninterested in evidence from other social sciences on its political acceptance challenges. And I, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's been my experience. Okay. And, and, and what are those challenges? Well, I'm just going to refer to a, a couple of pieces of literature why, uh, so the, the, I am not a political scientist, and the political scientists know so much more than I do on this, but what I've gleaned through reading and discussions and debates and, and so on is, um, you know, the various ways in which our democracy has flaws in it is not the perfect rational model, one of them being that groups who might face concentrated costs, let's say Albertans, um, from a climate policy are more motivated than the people who make small benefits, all the rest of us, to try to change or influence that policy in a way that's favorable to them, and that that's the endemic in, in policy making. So we're trying to have more rational policies that improve, on average, the net benefits to society, but it's very difficult. More, uh, more specific to ta anti-tax, an interesting book, The Myth of the Rational Voter by Brian Kaplan, looks at these, these huge surveys in the United States quite a few years ago. And, and what are the things where people don't think like economists? And where are they suspicious? They're very suspicious on anything to do with tax. And, but at the same time, so having done all that now, and so we're at the end of the, the battle for the, climate, for the carbon tax, and we're trying to think, how do we spread this elsewhere in Canada, uh, 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 in provinces in Canada, nationally, internationally, or, or any aggressive greenhouse gas policy? And we realized, oh, we've got a nice quasi-experiment right here in British Columbia. And what we mean by that as uh, researchers is government actually did several policies at the same time. Remember I said they were writing all of these policies at the same time? So we can see how people were aware of them, what the effect of those policies would have been, and so on. And that's what my next few slides talk about. So we became especially interested in policies like BC's clean electricity standard, with four times the greenhouse gas reduction of BC's carbon tax. That was what our model showed to the year 2020. So the clean electricity standard was a requirement that BC Hydro had to have 93%, 93 of any new electricity it got, it got should be zero emission. So it immediately had to cancel uh, contract agreements it had done for two coal plants in British Columbia. So just think, as recently as 10 years ago, BC Hydro had made agreements to, to, to fund a 250 megawatt coal plant in the Peace River and a 50 megawatt one near Princeton. And so the policy killed those. Uh, that was a policy that I was very involved in and, um, and um, is, is sort of, for me, it's way more important than the carbon tax in terms of things that I've been able to be involved in. Um, it's a flexible regulation. So it doesn't say we're going to have wind or solar or Site C or anything like that. It just says near zero emission. It's actually quite a a broad definition, um, but I won't spend time on that because I need to keep moving. So in, it, in general, though, I need to describe that type of policy. So I've got a slide here on calling them flexible regulations. Now, there's different names for these things. Um, it's a performance standard which obligates all firms in a sector to meet the requirement or pay others to do extra. And sometimes it's called a market-oriented regulation, and earlier we called it a niche market regulation. Um, uh, an example would be something that forces an increase in renewable electricity, like that policy I just mentioned in BC, or one that uh, a, a, a rising role of low and zero emission vehicles to be sold, or something decreasing, like decreasing industrial emissions intensity, or the carbon, in the, the carbon intensity of the mix of energy sources, fuels, 
could be electricity as well, that we, put in our, uh, that we uh, buy to put in our transportation uh, devices. So it can get closer to uh, cost effectiveness by mimicking some of the innovation and flexibility that occurs under emissions pricing. It doesn't pick, as I said, technology or fuel winners, but lets the market decide. And it allows trading among market participants. So different electricity providers, if one of them is just doing renewables and the other is doing natural gas, uh, and they need a certain percentage, then the renewables can sell credits. Or Tesla, um, in the California vehicle emissions uh, standard, uh, Tesla is only selling electric cars, so it can sell, it has extra credits that it can sell to other uh, vehicle uh, sellers. And it's that kind of idea. Um, in carbon pricing terminology, I'm just going to say that the carbon tax or cap and trade, cap on emissions, handout permits, you trade among yourselves, that's what California, Quebec, and Ontario have now, are explicit emissions pricing. The carbon tax, obviously, but even in cap and trade, up, there's a price for carbon permits, and we can see what that price is and compare it to the carbon tax, so we tend to call it uh, a, an explicit emissions price. Whereas flex regs, I can calculate what level of carbon price is implicit to have gotten this regulatory outcome in terms of technologies and fuels. So we call it an implicit emissions price. And that should become apparent when I show you some examples here uh, a bit later. <clears throat> so flex regs in the schema. Oh, and here's where I want to just make sure we're all on the same page with um, greenhouse gas policy. The big battle for the first 15 years of my career working in this area was to convince governments that because fossil fuels are fantastic and they're cheap uh, and we get amazing things from fossil fuels, that we really uh, need to have compulsory policies. And that would be regulations, like the flex reg I was just talking about, or emissions pricing, and as I said, cap and trade and carbon tax. So when Canada signed the Kyoto Protocol, um, our modeling team was again picked with a, a group from McGill to provide the modeling for the national climate uh, process to come up with a plan to achieve the Kyoto commitment. So this is 98, 99. And we showed, here's the carbon tax you need or the set of regulations. Pick one, pick the other, pick a combination. But the Christian government said, oh, you guys are pretty good modelers. We like how you show that we reached the Kyoto target. So we'll take that. But we're going to use Rick Mercer commercials and a voluntary challenge for people and labels and um, the voluntary uh, uh, the, something for corporations that was voluntary as well and of course those had almost no effect that's why i i went off with some colleagues and wrote a book called the cost of climate policy and we predicted that stuff but it, it's not like we were brilliant in predicting that it was child's play um, so i just wanted to show that so now we know we should be over here and governments are admitting that and so that's the progress. So humanity's moving very slowly, but that's the progress. And all I'm doing in this discussion is telling you that um, I'm finding, and that was the example of British Columbia, but others, that emissions pricing as the driving policy um, to make that transformation is really challenged through the political acceptability. So even though Justin Trudeau comes out and says, I'm going to have a, a carbon price of this height, and I'm going to force it right across the country, which I think is good and commendable and I support, I'm going to show you slides that show that level of price is nothing to the Paris commitment that he said that he would achieve. But they're now looking at regulations, and economists tend to criticize conventional regulations because they do tend to pick technologies and uh, they pick winners. And then those winners might end up being losers, like way more expensive than we thought, which is why we're in a market economy. We know there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and governments can't figure out if it's going to be a fuel cell car that will be the answer, or an electric car, or a biofuel car, or people shifting to transit, or bikes, or whatever. And so flexible regulations, as I've been describing them, try to be close to emissions pricing, but may score better on political acceptability. So that's the basic intent of my entire talk, actually. I've got more slides to sort of flesh that out now. <clears throat> um, and then there's other flex regs. I actually think in terms of time, I shouldn't uh, spend on these right now. Uh, the zero emission vehicle standard, or it can also be called a partial zero emission vehicle standard, but that's a long dis discussion. But I will tell you about the, um, the low carbon fuel standard, because that's what I'm going to model. So it's a weighted average full cycle carbon intensity. What does that mean, full cycle carbon intensity? So we know there's a certain carbon intensity in a liter of gasoline. 
but who made the gasoline and how much carbon went out? Was it made in the oil sands? Was it made uh, in Saudi Arabia? Was it a conventional oil well? Or what was it? So we look through the whole intensity. So we call that sort of well uh, to wheel, or well to, no, well to tank. Um, well to engine, carbon intensity. Uh, and, and when we say the word fuels, we're including electricity, hydrogen in that, which as an energy analyst, that's always irked me, uh, but uh, that's what you have to think about. So it's any energy form used in mobility in the case of the low carbon fuel standard. So sellers of fuels must reach intensity targets. So just as I gave you the example with cars where Tesla can make money because it gets credits, uh, in, the, in a, an emission vehicle standard, in this case, if I'm producing biofuels without a lot of emissions in the production process, for example, or BC Hydro is producing electricity, um, I can get credits for that. And, and the fuel uh, sellers, the, fuel, the sellers of gasoline, regular gasoline and regular diesel, are going to have to buy credits from me to get down the weighted carbon intensity of the package of fuels that they sell. So right now, BC Hydro, we have a low carbon fuel standard in British Columbia, and BC Hydro gets money because uh, it's able to get credits for the amount of electricity it uses in moving people around. And so they make some calculation for that. As I said, which fuels and this is the sellers that have to provide. So what it means, electricity or renew when this, if this policy gets important, the, like, is, is the driving force that we're using. So now you're talking about, okay, we're trying to get gasoline out of the transport uh, sector. If it's doing that, these, these people are going to have to um, increase, to get their intensity down, they've got to increase the amount of zero and low emission fuels, electricity, biofuels, that are hydrogen that are being used. And so they actually subsidize it. They buy, the buying and selling of credits means that the price of gasoline has to go up so they, the, the sellers of gasoline have enough money so they can buy credits from the sellers of electricity and, and renewables to mix into their package. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the slides later on, is the low carbon fuel standard. And so, that's, and so I'm going to try to s s move quickly through that. What we did do... Um, was we sur I'm going to move quickly here. We surveyed, uh, so remember I said this is hypothesis, and I had a very talented PhD student, uh, uh, Katya Rhodes, uh, and so uh, we did various uh, papers on this. It's not an area that I had done a lot of, but John Axon is a, a survey expert, a colleague of mine, and, and we surveyed people, and we were, we were especially interested in the carbon tax, because remember, by 2012, it got up to $30 per ton of CO2, but our model showed it would reduce about 3 to 5 megatons of CO2 from. Um, and in, in fact, the data we've got right now, people are updating as we go, it's still in that uh, ballpark as we're getting closer to 220. And, and that would be its annual reduction in the year 220 and, the, and, and thereafter. That clean electricity standard, by shutting and preventing coal plants, it, was way, it, 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 it is accounting for... for you know, for six times or five times the uh, uh, four times the, uh, the 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 carbon tax, but at a much higher cost. Um, so that's important. So what did we find in our survey? So first, and uh, so first, we did two things. First, we didn't even tell people about policies. We just said, can you list any of the policies we have in British Columbia? So that's the blue column. And what you see is, and the policies we listed up here were sort of the main ones. The clean electricity standard that I told you about, carbon neutral government, so I won't go into that. The low carbon fuel standard that I was just telling you about, the carbon tax, and then there was some tightening of energy efficiency regulations. And people couldn't, offhand, they could guess the carbon. We, this, is, this poll was done, the survey was done in 2012, I think. So it was like, just a year or so after, the carbon tax had been dominant in the media in British Columbia, and only, 20, only a quarter of respondents could come up with it. And then when we put a list of 15 policies in front of them, that's the orange column, and said, can you pick the five? Ten of them were fictional. We had a lot of fun making those up. And five were these. And, um, and then, it, then the carbon tax pops up. But still very low, uh, even people just guessing, looking at a list, to get what those other policies were. But what we, so that was awareness. Then we were really interested in um, was, so, so look at the difference here between the clean electricity standard and the carbon tax. Fine. Nobody knew about this. This was the big thing that reduced emissions. 
And, and then this was to do with, um, with uh, you know, would you op uh, oppose is red, strongly oppose is blue, should, and then this is support, somewhat strongly support. And what I wanted to show was two things. One, people would say, oh, you know what, we should keep moving ahead with the carbon tax, because look, 35 plus 21, so we got 56% support it and 44% oppose. But in Paul, again, talking about Manker Olson and concentrated costs and how policies and politics really work, um, experts will tell you that politicians are really focused on the size of the people who are strongly opposed. Because they're the ones that can really influence, are, are motivated to influence policy in ways that you might say are dirty, like just like distortionary. So that's the ratio that I'm interested in, 3 to 21. Even though people now knew that this one was more expensive, um, they, they still was very little opposition to those kinds of policies. Okay, so what I've done is I've given you some examples from a survey, and then in the real world, um, uh, we've got some evidence to support this from what's happened so far in climate policy, which I'll go through quickly. Uh, so flex regs may be more acceptable. Global evidence from 30 years. Oh, you know what? I'm going to skip. Let's see. Yeah, so that doesn't mean that we can't use carbon taxes. And there are examples of this, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, focus much on it, but Scandinavia has pretty high carbon taxes, actually still very low for industry, my earlier point, like they understand that, and that the high taxes, they already had really high energy taxes, and they simply renamed them as carbon taxes. Now, in the last few years, they have edged those up, but for much of the time that we were giving the Scandinavians credit for being the only ones with significant carbon taxes, it was, they had actually not had a tax increase in creating carbon taxes on fuels, for example. And they've used a lot of regs and partial public ownership on the electricity sector, in the energy they use in their district heating systems, and in all their public transportation. So in, in Sweden today, 90% of buses anywhere in the country are uh, E85. That means they use 85% ethanol uh, is the fuel that they're running on. And that's a, a public decision, obviously. But California is the leading jurisdiction in North America, and it doesn't have that big public sector influence. And if we look at California's policies, uh, and this was a study done by a colleague of mine, David Montgomery, but what it showed that n now the Californians have that cap and trade, right? And they're linked with Quebec. But when he simulated all of their policies sort of out to the year 2025, and he did this in about 2009 or 2010, uh, the estimate is, is that the regulations are actually really what are reducing emissions. So in the most activist jurisdiction in North America, it is not emissions pricing that's causing an acceleration in renewable electricity, uh, a change in the, in the transport in vehicles, uh, and so on. And what about in Canada? Uh, we've done similar work. That is, it is preliminary, some of it. Ontario was easy because the big reduction in Canada was Ontario closing its coal plants. Right? So that was not a carbon tax that did that. Uh, in BC, you already know which electricity policy it was. And in Alberta, uh, they talked about a carbon tax, and that may, lead to the def that may be a contributing factor in the defeat of Rachel Notley. Her, her popularity went down rapidly as she brought in that tax, and it's been hard to recover from that. Uh, and in fact, though, we calculate just recently, uh, my, my uh, research associate calculated that 96% of the reductions in greenhouse gases caused by policy in Alberta to the year 2030, so from last year to the year, from 2015 to the year 2030, something like 95% will be caused by the coal phase out, their methane emission regulations, uh, and so on, efficiency regulations, and so on. So not by the carbon tax that could be the political end for her. And it was a similar situation in Australia when the government fell because of a carbon tax. Um, so this one I'm going to skip. So this was this point about global, but we'll skip that. And then this, this was just fun for me. Uh, we, we always like to trot out our own. If, if you're an economist, you want to trot out your own uh, Nobel Prize winner and, uh, and to, to, to support what you're arguing. So I've got some here. Economists should cease proffering policy advice as if they're employed by a benevolent despot. And the second one, for example, I call upon my fellow economists to postulate some model of the state of politics before proceeding to analyze the effects of alternative policy measures. Um, so now our latest sort of greenhouse gas policy research related to that. So 
what do we actually see? And I said this earlier, that carbon tax in leading jurisdictions is going to be very low for trade exposed industries. It's a global problem. How are you going to do that? And I can come back to that in questioning. Um, C tax and cap and trade revenue are also rarely used in an economically efficient way. And I'll just I'll leave that hanging out there without going into details. At the same time, climate, so here I am saying, let's, let's, uh, let's compare these, but the regulations are often depicted, by economists at least, in the worst possible design. But in reality, climate regs range from fairly flexible to very flexible. So we've been looking at this in terms of Canadian, federal, and provincial government uh, policies that they've done, that they're intending to do, and their options for hitting targets such as Paris or our 2050 targets. So currently, I've already said, $30 carbon tax in BC and or Alberta has copied it now. $20 cap and trade permit price in Ontario and Quebec, so that's like the explicit price. Trudeau has said we will have a carbon price uh, this year of $10, rising to 50 by 2022. Well, I mean, he's up for election before that, so, but anyway, at least uh, pushing on that. Um, but what is really needed to achieve Paris? And so this is a study that I and a couple of my research associates, Mikola Hein and Tiffany Voss did, Mikola is now with a consulting um, group of my former students in downtown, and Tiffany, um, I just visited her, she's in Paris at the International Energy Agency. Um, and so we looked at this, and we, so here are, the fle here are the flex regs we looked at. I'm not going to, they're in electricity, vehicles, trucks, buses, and rail, but we didn't even do buildings, because we, it was just the three of us going full tilt. Um, and then we wanted to show, okay, you can achieve Paris, um, so... The yellow and the gray lines, apologies, ignore them. Like they are, uh, because Trudeau had done this sort of after our study, he had said, okay, I'm going to have a price of $50 by 2022. And so that's, um, and, then, and then he didn't say what he was going to do to get to 2030. So we just taken two hypotheses. One, that he would um, go to $100, and that's where his policies would get in terms of emissions coming down. This is where emissions would be without more policy. And then another one was he just stays at, the, so stays at the 50 or works his way up to $100. We are running two scenarios that I'm going to show you, I'm showing you the results from, that both hit the Paris target. That's what Canada's emissions should be in 2030 under Paris. One of, the, one of them is, a, is, the, is continuing to ramp up that carbon tax that Trudeau started and not do a lot of flex regs. And the other one is to, is to really go with the flex regs that was in the package that we just showed. So, where does the carbon tax have to go to? If we just use the red, that, now this is the price in dollars per ton. Remember British Columbia, right now, you and I are paying 30, or, yeah, $30 per ton CO2, so right about here. And sort of Canada-wide, it averaged out to something like that. And then it needs to get to about $200. So that's like another 40 cents a liter on a, gallon, on a liter of gasoline. So another 40 cents or so. And those, these two I told you not to pay attention to. And then this is using our flex regs to achieve the Paris target. So we still accepted the price increase in the sort of the national level of price, um, but we didn't have it going up, or, or it went up slightly in that run. And, and so you can achieve it in either way. Now, so the, the, the carbon pricing policies without either flex regs or raising that price won't achieve uh, Paris. And so what are governments doing now? What's the federal government doing and provincial governments? Saying we're going to do methane emissions, coal power plant phase out, uh, cap on oil sands emissions with possible trading, low carbon fuel standard, um, and others as well. And now, the last few slides, I'm going to not show them. And the re they're just on the simulation of a low-carbon fuel standard nationally. And I'm not going to show them because I'd rather get into question periods. So I'll just tell you what they say. Um, it, what, what, we, what we do is we say, let's figure out the economically efficient uh, amount of, um, uh, of reduction that should occur in the transportation sector under Paris. So we just ran a carbon tax. Now let's design flexible regulations that get that outcome. And then let's see what that means. Like how far away is this from the economic efficiency that, uh, politician, that economists are interested in? And we find the policies are almost identical. Uh, that the amount that people um, uh, shift to buses and transit from their cars, you know, so the shift in mode 
reductions in mobility, then car choices end up being about the same in both approaches, which is a way of saying they're probably fairly similar from an economic efficiency basis. So I have two slides on that, and I'm not going to show you, and I'm going to go to my concluding slide. They're really interesting, but um, all right. <laughs> Historical evidence and public opinion surveys suggest that accelerating greenhouse gas reduction um, is more politically difficult if relying on emissions pricing. And so we researchers can and should be helping policymakers by exploring the political acceptability versus economic efficiency trade-off between carbon tax and flex regs, for example. And our preliminary research suggests that there's only a small economic efficiency differences between the two policy approaches, provided that the flex regs are designed in certain ways. You can design them to be very economically inefficient. So um, there's other things that we haven't yet researched along this line, though, about economic efficiency and equity effects. So that's why we're inviting other people to join us in exploring this critical research area. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the question period. Repeat the question for the video audience. Yep, yep. So who, any questions? Here we go. Yep. Um, I'd like you to comment on two parts of your presentation. Uh, first part is um, right at the beginning, you mentioned probably outside of this room, we're obviously interested, um, that there is very small interest in the whole issue. And I'm wondering if um, we are, in fact, efficiently targeting the right people. So, as a simple example, if you targeted the educational sector of the universities uh, right through from uh, teaching, the curricula that's decided by the BC uh, government of the day, um, right through to secondary ec education, that this would be more economically efficient than trying to, uh, how should we say, uh, manipulate or change statistics, which is very difficult for people, even myself, to, you know, I found this quite difficult stuff, to be quite honest. Yep. So really, you're looking towards the next generation to be taught the right thing. So that's the first part. The second part is, um, I, I sense that you feel that uh, the cap and trade has uh, a greater part to play, and I'm not that convinced, and I'd like you to comment on this, that there's a lot of manipulation that can carry on with cap and trade. So, as an example, how do you compare the emissions of, say, uh, a pulp mill in Crofton uh, with the emissions from the zinc smelter in Trail? How do you do that? And what manipulations are around that? It's a bit like the agricultural land research in some ways. You get enough politicians involved, and someone can say, here's the level that we're aiming for. Right, I'm going to cut you off okay. there. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a huge question about education, like, um, and I think it is important to be educating people about when to be suspicious of government. So it'll be uh, like, are, are we really going to be reducing emissions with this? And I see that as a huge educational goal uh, and, and, or difficulty. When we get to the point of educating people in some ways that change their behavior, like change their greenhouse gas emissions, I see that as virtually impossible. And I think there's, and, and I say that as someone who just really follows that literature and have paid attention to it. And I can just give you, I don't mean to be flippant, but I'll just like some, we are all being educated all the time about many things, about how to enjoy our lives and have more friends and, uh, and eat, eat better and so on. And when societally we make an effort to sort of educate about eating habits, um, about risk taking, about uh, your greenhouse gas emissions, it's extremely difficult. Uh, and so I, we've, we have actually had massive education campaigns that I was referring to under the Chrétien government. You probably don't remember them. BC Hydro has had massive education campaigns about electricity use and behavior. And most research has shown that there has not been a huge effect to those things. There, there is little incremental effects, and then something else comes over and swamps that. Everyone wants to get now uh, a, a, an outdoor heater. You know, suddenly everyone's buying one. 
And um, oh, I, and anyway, if you're someone who watches this as I do, it's it's like it's overwhelming. Like the, now that the movement to get food already prepared. So the, the amount of refrigeration area in stores compared to 30 years ago is, is phenomenal. And that's just an example of how other tastes are going on that have significant effect for energy use and emissions. The, the, you, you asked about cap and trade and one can be manipulated or the other. All of these things have their challenges and I won't, I won't go into that. I'm not really enamored with cap and trade. I was talking about flexible regulations. So um, uh, more to do with technologies and fuel outcomes rather than aggregate emission outcomes. But whether you're going to tax carbon or cap it or pick technologies and fuels, you're going to have to be getting rough estimates of the emissions themselves. So I think that's sometimes an unfair critique of cap and trade that you've got to measure the emissions. You have to do it for carbon tax and the other policies as well. Uh, next, and then so Simon, and then over there. And so short questions, and I'll give short answers. So I have, um, I have difficulty reconciling your thought to get to 2030 Paris uh, uh, targets through flex regs and or carbon tax. And what I'm interested in is your thoughts on today, we're at 750 million tons approximately. Uh, Paris calls for 523, I think. Um, if you can use the flex regs, you can use the carbon tax, but the reality is you have to stop carbon entering the atmosphere, which means we have to build substantive levels of infrastructure in terms of new online capacity for generating electricity. People have to shift to their transportation <coughs> modes, heating their homes through electricity like this. There is a certain inertia to building big infrastructure. I mean, site C is taking 10 years of discussion, let alone well, getting on the ground. Many folks don't realize that Site C could power 1.6 million Tesla cars. So you could power the whole of BC's cars with Site C. How do we build that infrastructure in 10 years? How do you connect your flex regs and carbon tax to actual boots on the ground, physicality of change? So I've been talking about which policy we use to cause change. So a debate among policy types and their effectiveness. I think that you're raising an issue which is the, the human uh, global energy system, which is based on the built environment around us, factories, uh, energy facilities, uh, transportation networks, has a lot of inertia in that system. How can this happen fast enough for a target like Paris and so on? And, um, and I think there is a lot of inertia in that system. And as a modeler, that's been a, a source of reassurance to me because people say, well, your model must be way wrong. And I'll say, well, there's actually a lot of inertia in that system. So if I'm just foc forecasting out 10, 15 years, um, it, it's not bad. But um, you just sort of say, you had an assumption in there that everything has to be this big thing and take a long time. And that's really not what we're seeing right now. So we really know it has to happen in electricity generation and in transportation. In fact, you do those two things around the world, um, you're there. Like you're, you're, you're 80 to 90% there. Then you have to worry about steel production and cement production. But you can, do, you can add on carbon capture for storage facilities on those kind of plants within three or four years, keeping the same, same steel production process. In electricity, we are trying to phase out coal plants. And that's going to be really hard in the developing world but it can be done quite quickly in the developed world and then with help uh, happening elsewhere. So Ontario in 2004 started to phase out coal plants that represented 25% of their electricity generation infrastructure and in 10 years, gone. Lots of small stuff that you can build quickly. So Site C is not a, the, the argument against, one of the arguments against Site C was don't big, build these mega projects because you can, you can ramp out wind power and so on quite quickly. Electric cars, so when people say we're going to stop moving in cars, I say, oh boy, how are you going to do that? Like you're going to have everybody in some new mobility thing. We don't need that. When we, if we're moving into electric cars, um, you get these dramatic reductions in emissions without hardly any infrastructure. And so, yes, there's some, there's charging stations we'll build in certain places for convenience and so on. But you really, like, this turnover of the vehicle stock is 15 years, 20 years. And so... <clears throat> So when I so I watched Brazil, like I look at the data for Brazil, right? They decided we don't we don't want gasoline. This was in the 80s, and they were afraid of oil imports. It is shocking 
how fast their emissions went down in the transportation sector in, in a very short period of time. There's now 240 different kinds of models of flex fuel vehicles in Brazil, E85. E so the ki and, and that was just from a new push they did in 2005. So that would be my, my argument. I mean, Vaclav Smeal writes a lot about inertia in the system. And it's, it's, for me, it's shocking how he doesn't look at the cases where we've done things rapidly. Uh, France bring, building nuclear power. Sweden in a, in a great, there's been huge transformations that have happened in incredibly short periods of time in our energy system. So I think, be careful about saying it's all inertial. Oh yeah, maybe not. Well, I mean, I would argue it's more political reasons that we can't get there by 2030, hence my talk, than technological and built environment reasons. Because the electric cars run on city streets. The electricity goes through wires we already have, whether it comes from a wind turbine or whatever. I better, go ahead. I have three short, oh, three short questions. Oh, yeah, I have one. Okay. So um, pick one. Do I appreciate hierarchy. economic efficiency, but are all, when you model, are all the costs in, what is the cost of climate change? What is the cost of extra insurance? What is the cost of severe weather, of refugees, of all of those things? Right. Are those costs in? Yeah. So I, um, so there's two things. Before you even start to read that, don't look at um, I've been saying, how can we economically efficiently achieve a greenhouse gas reduction objective? So at that point, I don't need to know what the damages were. The implicit assumption is we need to get down to this target because the benefits of doing so will exceed the costs. So there's an, an assumption of what the cost. So if we say 2 degrees Celsius is our limit, we are implicitly saying the costs of not achieving that exceed, uh, you know, are, are, are really high, so it's better to spend the cost of not going past 2C. That's the, and so the Stern report in 2006 was the kind of cost-benefit analysis you're talking about. And he said that if you stayed on the 4C path, so the 4C temperature increase, by 2050 it would cost about 20% of your GDP in damages. So those are the damages you're talking about. But to not go on that path, it would have been 5% of GDP. But he was implying that that cost of a, a reductions, the policy would be the perfect policy. It would be a global carbon tax. So I just do, I'm not going to uh, go through this with you, but I do a thought experiment in which I say, what if we don't have the most efficient policy and we use flex regs? So um, when uh, Catherine McKenna was in uh, Bonn recently, she tried to launch uh, an off-coal program around the world. And I've been talking to policy people in, in, uh, in Ottawa about, okay, and start an aluminum one, start a some steel one, start a cement one, um, where you know, we're trying to do regs on sectors around the world. I think that'll be politically easier, but it won't be. It'll cost, it might cost 7% of GDP instead of five. It, it, but if, if we have an 80% likelihood with trying to get that single price of political failure, and remember, climate policy is difficult no matter what, 50% likely of failure if we go with flex regs, uh, I can show you the calculations that it makes more sense to go with flex regs, even though they're more expensive locally, like they're, they're economically inefficient compared to carbon tax, but because they have a chance of us doing locally and globally what we need, we think is optimal from an economic efficiency perspective, they're better for that. So I'm glad you asked that question because I, I just felt like I hadn't left enough time for a question period, so I jumped through that one. I had someone over here and then you over there. Yeah, and then Simon. Yeah. I'm going to get you to put your BCUC back on as well and give you a local example. I've got a technology I've developed that is, uh, has natural gas using solar um, a system. But we have two gatekeepers here, Hydro and Fortis. And Fortis gives out rebates that based on dollars per thousand BTUs. So the encouragement is to get more condensing boilers out and kill all other different types. So they become the gatekeeper here, stopping good technologies from getting in the marketplace. They're, they're not stopping it, but they're distorting the economics, um, if, if you'll go with me. That, like, yeah, so you can still do these things. You can still put in an electric heat pump. Um, you know, you, you have an ability to do that, but it would be better if the economics were right for that. And so, absolutely. Uh, and that's why I worked with the city of Vancouver on the policy which was um, a natural gas phase out uh, in buildings. And what's interesting is that one, you know, we'll see where that gets to, but the feds right now, from meetings I was in in late November, December, 
have um, started to split up this thing called the clean fuel standard. It's like the low carbon fuel standard, but it's all across sectors. And in the, what we said in buildings is just say, well, the content of renewable natural gas, so that's biomethane from like landfills, has to go up. Because Fortis has said it, it could. Now, whether it'll go up to 100%, I say that's going to be really expensive and we're going to end up using more electricity. Already almost half of people getting space heating in British Columbia, where they live, are using electricity rather than natural gas. So it's not, we're not that far off there. There was someone there, and then I had Simon. Yep. And then you, oh, Mark. Just in terms of looking at, say, how you select projects, I'm going to say project A that's maybe gas related and other projects are I'm trying to decide how I go, but I need long term uh, uh, pricing or signals to affect which decision I make. So if I've got one that I've got a straight carbon tax, and, and maybe it's known and it's increasing at a regular interval, or I've got flex rates, however they may be, but you know, it could be any time I don't know where they're going to be. Can you comment on how you might effectively handle those? Yes. So you're talking about um, you're talking about electricity generation, right? Because I want to clarify that. Like to me, there's industry, there's transportation, and buildings. So in electricity, 35 to 40, at least 35 states in the United States have a renewable portfolio standard. So, and most of them are uh, climbing over time. So they are a requirement that the share of renewables go up over time. And it's a bit like our clean electricity standard in, in British Columbia, where BC Hydro would then have closed envelope bids for people to, to get to get into that market and then would sign long-term contracts. And that's at, you know, where the price is partially fixed, maybe has adjusters in it. That is not, I mean, we don't have anywhere where someone says, here's what the carbon tax will be five years from now, 10 years, I mean, we have a little bit federally, but you, even with a carbon tax, you don't have certainty what that price will be. So the irony is, in the jurisdictions where we've used flex regs, like, like the renewable portfolio standard, we've actually been able to give higher investment certainty to people because the utility who has to buy a certain percentage to get those credits has to sign long-term contracts or those investments won't be made. And so the seller, uh, the investor and then seller of that electricity um, will, at least right now, would get more assurance than they would from a carbon tax. We tried under Gordon Campbell, that was one thing that I was partly responsible for, was to have this rising schedule. You know, I knew economists would love that. And we actually did it to 2012 and then he formed a special committee that I was the advisory, advisor to doing the analysis to get to the year 2020. And we were going to be at $100 by 2020, but politically we didn't get there. So the, the goal was to give that kind of certainty. But you have some of it with long-term contracts at BC Hydro. Simon, and then uh, Warren. Just uh, uh, quickly, but given, so if the BC had not had a carbon tax, people would probably have heard more about the low-carbon fuel standards. Like there's a body out there that's trying to oppose, you know, trying to oppose uh, climate legislation. So the energy behind the opposition might have moved towards the other policy. And, and what I'm wondering about might not have been one for one, but trade. What I'm wondering about is it does. I mean, is there an argument based on your research that the federal government right now needs to be pushing for a carbon tax in order not just have the carbon tax, but there not to be that much, much opposition to all the other policies that are also affected. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, I mean, I, I, I think if I, ta if I told you, and there's some really good people working there, a lot of them are ex-students of mine, but I don't think it's as uh, uh, Machiavellian as, as that might be. It's sort of like, we'll send, out this, we'll send out this thing and they'll shoot all the arrows at it and then we'll slip through. Um, I like it though, yeah. Absolutely. And, so, and also, um, maybe I said this, but... Um, so, you know, I've been finding stuff that carbon tax is just a disaster, no matter what level, sort of Stéphane Dion type disaster, the Prime Minister of Australia, and so on. I think it has changed a little bit. So even in that, like in Canada at least, you know, the United States is bigger, it, 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 yes, in the United States in sort of Canada-like states, you know, New York, California, and so on, Washington, Oregon, but in, in, in Canada, I think Trudeau was able, partly what his, his message in that election, and so this is me talking off the top of my head, by the way, like I, uh, that it was, I'm uh, a millennial, or I'm with the millennials, and in a way, a carbon tax, 
uh, is a symbol of that I'm committed to climate change and that you can then start to trust this government, unlike a Stephen Harper type government. Then they quickly find out, oh, actually, we don't want that price to go too high. We better start. So I think it's been more that kind of a thing. It was like in the, before the election and then in the election, it was like they, they had some difficult decisions to make. And, um, you know, I don't know if they'd asked me what I would have said, but I wasn't part of that. I might have said, oh, you know, keep quiet about a carbon. Oh, I remember saying that to George Heyman in, a, in the BC election. He did call me. But, um, and then he went, they, they said, no, we're going to do it because Trudeau's got cover for us because Trudeau already says it's going to go there, so we're going to put the carbon tax to that level. But in the case of, of Trudeau and them, this is my hypothesis, is, is that they actually, their polling showed them that they could get enough young people and uh, out and concerned, and not just young, but uh, with Stephen Harper, that that, that was their, a credibility thing that would be a net positive for them in voting. Um, but I think they knew then and they really know now that there's a limit to how you could use that for transforming the energy system. And that's why I, the title of my talk is, you know, for accelerating the transition, which, as you say, we need to do. Warren? Mark, you talked a bit about the distributional consequences of carbon taxes and how to design some of that into it. You know, as you ramp up flex regs and they become you know, much stronger, those will have distributional consequences as well. And are you doing work on how to, do, how to deal with that? Yes. I mean, it's in the conceptual stage right now. Um, and, but I'm very excited about it, and I'll just tell you why. The, um, so first of all, though, uh, I, I, did, I slipped in there somewhere that I'm getting tired, and it's often against my former PhD student, Nick Rivers, who's a close friend, but it, it'll always be like, here's the carbon tax, and we're going to use it to reduce pro uh, productivity harming taxes elsewhere in the economy. And I'm like, okay, can you give me all the examples where we've done that other than BC? Like it's, it's, no, they use the money for all sorts of stuff. Now let's figure out what the total economic effect is. But at least with carbon taxes, you could use the money for equity, uh, uh, you know, getting the money to low-income people, doing energy efficiency on social housing, da da da, -da things like that. Um, think about the vehicle emission standard. So I, I didn't explain that one, but it's a, it's a similar to the it's to do with car sales. It says you got to sell so many of these ultra-low or zero-emission vehicles. So it could be electric, but it could even be plug-in hybrids that use a bit of gasoline or biofuel or something like that, and. So in, in economics, I better not spend too much time on this, but we, we're thinking about price responsiveness. So if I'm a vehicle seller, I need to get money to, um, to uh, subsidize the, the cars that are, are running on electricity. Or I need to get their price down so I hit my sales targets and don't have to pay a big fine per car. Where will I, what cars will I raise the price on? And we find that really wealthy people, like buying, I don't know, a sixty, seventy thousand dollar BMW, are not going to notice if that car is one hundred dollars more expensive, <laughs> and um, and they're not going to be sensitive to that, as opposed to the lower income people who are just barely buying your standard model cars, and so I'm just we're just trying to set up looking at some research on what we call responsiveness to price. Uh, and this comes back from old electric utility literature and so on, how to properly set economically efficient tariffs for electricity, Baumol and Oates and, and these researchers. And so I think my hypothesis is that there's going to be a, a big wealth transfer from the rich, not to the very poor, but to low income people that are either part of a car sharing program or own a car, but it's a very sort of basic kind that is probably a plug-in hybrid or something like that. That's my hypothesis. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be right. But anyway. Um, yes, you? Uh, yeah. 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 So were you part of the BC Clean Energy Act? Can you come together with that? <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I was. It doesn't mean they did what I said. Right. Yeah. So, I, so you said about uh, BC Hydro and how everything coming online has to be net zero. Yeah. And you said it was a broad definition. Yes. Yeah, because I, net zero to me is zero carbon from like manufacturing and like getting all of the materials to when it goes online, say for site C. 
that would not be net zero to me. So can you explain the broad definition and how that works? Yeah, so we find that in electricity generating systems, the embedded carbon in the facility itself is almost invariably minuscule compared to the operating life reduction or emissions, or like a coal plant versus Site C. The, the emissions associated with building Site C, as opposed to running Site C for the next 500 years, but let's say 100 years, um, those emissions will be 0.0000001%. Now, in the but we, you associated this with the Clean Energy Act, so I want to clarify there. So before the Clean Energy Act, Three years before, in January 2007, we won a wonderful battle, which was to go from what the NDP had had, which, which is what led to these coal plant contracts, to a, what was a 90% clean, near clean. It wasn't perfectly clean, so, and, and I was happy with that. There can be cases where you're burning natural gas at UBC or Simon Fraser University or a hospital, and we're going to generate electricity with that. You have to slightly up the natural gas, but the, it's a fantastic thing to do, cogeneration. So, so we added in stuff like that as well. And that's the other point, is that no option is completely zero emission. So I don't even like terms like clean energy or green energy. They all involve trade-offs, local impacts, larger impacts. In the clean energy, so, so that was done in January 2007. Then, three years later, in the Clean Energy Act design, um, I wanted it to go to 100% from 90. And that was what I was mostly involved in. And I finally, we fought all these battles and it ended up at 93. And that's sort of where it stayed. The, in the act itself, there was a long list of things that should be exempt from the Utilities Commission purview, including smart meters, Site C, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I fought as hard as I could against their, as a former Utility Commission chair, I said these things should be reviewed by the Utilities Commission uh, as are they prudent investments. And um, Gordon Campbell was really pissed off at the Utilities Commission right then. And I can't blame him because it had also, it had just rejected his idea that um, he wanted to stop emission reduction. Uh, like they, the utility, it was a decision where the Utilities Commission said you should keep using the Bard Thermal Plant. And he wanted to stop using the Bard Thermal Plant because of the greenhouse gas emissions. And he found the Utilities Commission was blocking his efforts to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that was this suspicion. And I kept saying to him, yes, but you're messing it up for years to come. You might not be here in a few years. You know, I don't know if I said that, but that's certainly what I was thinking. <laughs> Yeah. So, I don't, uh, a couple more, Barry? Uh, uh, you talked at the very end, you said $200 a ton to get to carbon. This is straight carbon tax. What's the price per ton, did you say, on your flex rate? Oh, plus? so we've done a couple of scenarios, but oops, basically, the, the flex regs we did, Oh, we originally ran it to 40, but now the last study that I didn't show you the slides of, we took Trudeau's run, so uh, $50 in 2022, and, and then uh, kept that constant, I think, and assumed flex regs on top of that. I mean, the all in, like, you take all the tons and you take all the money, including the implicit to it. What is the shadow, or whatever you want to call it? Oh, I see. Yeah, we have not simulated what the trading price of the flex regs would, well, so look, what, so my guess is that it won't be a lot different. So people won't be paying any tax or getting any money back, but they will be buying electric cars, right? And they'll be buying biofuel and electricity, and someone who sells gasoline will be selling it to them. So because of, there's issues that economists struggle with, we call it welfare effects and so on, we've kept that out, and we did a study that, um, I will show you just that, um, very quickly, this is the one I didn't show. So it, it had this great effect, which was that the, the gas, the, here's the gas, these are the price per liter of gasoline, and this is, this is just in transportation, achieving Paris. Here's where the gasoline price at the pump goes under the carbon tax. Here's where the price at the pump goes under the low carbon fuel standard. Why? The price still has to go up because the sellers of gasoline have to raise the price to have money to give it to electricity consumers and so on. But it doesn't go up as fast. So an economist says, well, is this 
is this the same economically efficient outcome? Like, is, or is that mark? And remember, the $200 is only the price that we get to in the year 2050. So, uh, and that's, that's what's adding about 40 cents a liter to the price of gasoline, as I told you earlier. And that's how I'm approximating uh, costs right now. And so what do you see? Well, you see that we switch, so blue is just gasoline cars. Don't worry if it's electricity or biofuel. This is cars, not trucks. And it just shows, oh, that means, you know, that nice high tax, which of course got politicians defeated over and over again, but somehow it stayed there. Um, it meant that we moved more quickly to get out of gasoline cars, slightly more quickly. And then what was the effect on all these other things that we talk about? So this one is, uh, this one is efficiency of cars. So the carbon pricing gets cars a little, large cars a little more efficient. Oh, we have more, less large cars, more small cars. Less uh, large trucks, uh, more small trucks. In mode shifting, we get a few more people, less people driving alone, a few more people carpooling, a few more people taking, taking transit, and it's very slight, more walking and cycling. And so they, what you should assume is that the implicit price is still going to be not much higher than $200. Um, because remember, when we calculate implicit price, it's what is the price we need to get the same outcome as, as the carbon tax. And I'm getting almost the same outcome. Carbon tax is superior. It gets a few more of us walking and cycling, but it's very uh, marginal. This is great. These two questions allowed me to get the slides out that I'd skipped over. You go ahead. Um, a bit divergent from your talk, but um, to New York City, I'm sure you know, they're divesting their um, investments from fossil fuels. What sort of, have you looked at all, like, at the kind of impact doing things like that can have um, on reductions? Because that sort of seems more sellable even than you're showing, like, flex regs. Um, yeah. So divestment strategies. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Do you know no, I mean, you can, you can divest, and then somebody else will figure out how... This is, it's a global market economy. Somebody else will figure out to put their money in there, and, that, and, that, and they won't be as ethical as you were. And so the more we focus on that, instead of... I mean, the only things... So here's... So we... Once again, the NDP government has put a new uh, climate team together. All we need are the following things. A rapidly rising LCFS. Forget industry right now. And, um, and electricity is done in BC. Um, a rapidly tightening vehicle emission standard for those reasons that I talked about. It also it gets the right vehicles there for the fuel people. So you have to define what is a, a zero or partial zero emission vehicle. Um, a rapidly rising biomethane content for natural gas delivered to buildings. I talked about that earlier. Flatten electricity tariffs. We have a stepped up electricity tariff. It made sense 20 years ago when I was involved in, uh, in bringing it in, uh, but not now. And then use some of the rising carbon tax revenue from Trudeau's pricing to give out candy uh, and maybe some BC Hydro's revenue to uh, some electrification uh, in industry and biofuels. But basically, um, if the, to the extent that we can get electrification in industry and help them do that, great, and if we're putting on other policies, but you'll notice that I'm mostly leaving industry off the hook. So to me, these are the important things, and things like divestment strategy and other voluntary programs, I mean, you can, we can talk about them and so on, but it'd be a huge mistake if they're out there and they're actually leading us to believe we're doing something when this is what we have to do, in my view. Uh, do I have time for one or two more? Or? One more. One more, okay, go ahead. This is a great discussion of policy to reach the targets. Do you have a comment on the relevance of the targets? Hansen says we have two decades to, to take emissions to zero. Government promises are on track to put us at 4 degrees C. Yeah, so the question was, um, what about the targets? So, <sighs> humanity should have been acting much earlier. We are not acting fast enough, and so we are going to incur some significant costs, both in damages and in uh, quick action remediation or prevention. And I, I don't talk a lot about that because I want to keep us focused on the policies as I've described here. But um, sort of like uh, my kids are 
in their 20s, environmentally active, and when they, when they get depressed about that image, I point out to them just how innovative humans will be as we start to take on this issue, whether it's making snowfall in Greenland and Antarctica, uh, reflecting solar rays, uh, slowing acidification of oceans, all the sort of stuff that you'd all want to say, that's terrible, we shouldn't be doing that, we shouldn't be playing God with the planet, agreed, but we already are playing God with the planet. So it'll be similar to the scenario in World War II, when people like Churchill were saying, you've got to act against this global risk, and he was doing it in the early 30s and certainly in the mid-30s, and we didn't do anything, but then when we finally recognized that risk and that it was too late to have stopped Adolf Hitler uh, and the and you know the Nazi Germany's globalism. We we were then we got really smart on stuff, um, including making horrible weapons, uh, but doing them at incredibly fast rates. Jet airplanes, uh, advanced uh, weaponry of all kinds, and of course the nuclear bomb, uh, etc. So uh, it's not a good story, but it 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 won't play out in my view that we're just going to have all these things happen to us, that we're not going to be able to suck CO2 back out of the atmosphere. We're going to do those things. It's going to be really expensive and dumb, but that's what we'll have to do. Thank you. So please join me in thanking Mark. Uh, thank you.